I'm The Voice, and this is a Divi community-produced video from the Foundation. Today I've got Rob, and I've got Neegs, and Hi guys. boy, have we got an update for you. How's it going, guys? Really hey everyone. Good. Hey. Happy <laughs> to be back again. We are back. Hello. We're back as avatars. Yes. Yes, yeah. I hope people <laughs> are enjoying usual. our funny stuff here. <laughs> so It is fun um, for us. Let's get into news. Let's get cracking here. Um, oh my goodness! So yes, we um, every every two weeks there's always a lot to filter through. Um, you know, want to make sure we hit the high points and not every single thing because we could just do that all day. Um, the I think the big one was uh, news about Mount Gox. Yeah. Um, so you want to uh, talk about that? Yeah, I think that's a good one. What do you think, Neeks? Yeah, sure. Let's talk about Mount Gox. So. There is, so um, Mongox is going to start refounding people that have been, uh, that have been impacted by mm -hmm. the situation now a very long time ago in 2014 because of the hack. And so we're talking about, I think, something like 140,000 Bitcoin. That's, um, that's a huge amount of money. And so there is a lot of fear that depending on the way it is distributed, um, it will actually go on the market and, and create some uh, huge dump. And of course, it, it created a little bit of panic on that. Um, but then there is also some questions about how it will be distributed. Maybe you want to talk about that, Rob? Sure. I mean, uh, I think originally it was, it was like, we're going to refund you at the price of Bitcoin at the time uh, yeah. when the hack happened. And that was obviously very disappointing for a lot of people uh, because you know bitcoin is worth so much more now and they wanted their value in bitcoin um which i understand that but like you also got to admit that when it went from like four hundred dollars to say ten thousand dollars a ton of those people would have sold then <laughs> so uh it's a little real unrealistic to assume that every single people that had their Bitcoin on an exchange were going to keep mm -hmm. that Bitcoin for this whole time. So I understand that there might have been some hesitancy or some justification for not doing that. But the end result is um, they have to return the value of the present day value, as I understand. That's right. I think that's, so what, that's what they're hoping for. Go ahead, Neeks. Yeah, what I've seen is that um, initially was... Um, it was definitely decided that they would get $483 per Bitcoin. But then in 2018, uh, a court in, in Japan actually approved a different way to proceed uh, instead of bankruptcy. And so it opens more flexible things and it is expected that they will get their value in coin or um, the assets directly. So we don't, we don't know. Actually, nobody knows. There is a lot of speculation. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we will see what <laughs> happens. But it has definitely triggered. Um, that's, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say. That yeah, it, I was going to say it triggered volatility on the market. And I, I don't think it will stop before, before things start moving and some more clarity. It's always the fear, right? Fear and uncertainty that mm -hmm, creates right. the more volatility. Yes, exactly. I thought it was funny because, like, you know, you see it starting to dump. And, like, if you've been in this a while, you've seen it dump a thousand times. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden Twitter's filled with it's going below 50. And, you know, the end result might be that. I don't know. Um, I'm not a trader. Uh, but I knew that this time, like, this particular spike down wasn't going to be that. It bounced off of, like, 59 something. Um, but the real issue is really um, what people want to what people who are not used to this are, are hearing i think to me um and yeah. so they, they hear mixed messages they freak out uh especially the etf people uh, to me they're the, they're going to be the ones who are most likely to just dump everything get out um the or i guess new people maybe too uh so i think we're going to see these until there's even more clarity uh i the thing i don't quite get is it, there was a hack where does this bitcoin come from it wasn't all recovered. So I'm, I'm confused how people are getting their, expecting to get all their money back, I should say. Like, wh where is that coming from? I don't from? know. I mean, it's, it's, they have 65,000, I think, is what most, uh, what, what is being spoken about that is going mm -hmm. to go to holders if 
it does go that way, right? We still right. don't know. We know the court decided, as Neeg stated, that um, they would get their like asset or their asset back in in what it would be. Um, that sixty five thousand is where that fud is coming from. I, yeah. That's it's a little that's understandable. Where I'm speculating the, the fud is coming yeah. from. Right? There's only two ways that shows up in full on the market, though. The first the first way is Mt. Gox chooses to or is forced to pay people in fiat because mm -hmm. if they have those coins, they're going to dump one hundred percent of those. I mean, like it may not all happen at once, but in the end, they don't have any money, and that's where the money is. So they're going to convert it. Of course, if people get their money back in bitcoin um some of those people are absolutely going to dump it but it won't be a hundred percent um no. so I, I think the better condition is that people get some value back in the crypto asset rather than <laughs> rather than demanding yeah, I, or, or having to get fiat if if most people sell there's again we have that mentality as we spoke about in the last segment right the last update was there's a hodl mentality you're trained to hodl but there's also a trader mentality which says you don't get emotionally attached to anything and there's a percentage and a portion of our community that's gotten larger that's like that we don't care about the project what we care about is the profit and then you sell and recover whatever you put into it and those kinds of trading uh, uh, theories that people go into that and so i agree certain people will sell but I think if you're forced to sell, which is, which is where you have a person, whatever they have, let's say you need a new car or something, and and you have Bitcoin, no matter what, if all of your liquidity is tied up in Bitcoin, you have to sell that Bitcoin, and you have to sell it now. <laughs> that's yeah. that's a different kind of a sell. That's not quite distressed, but if Mount Gox has to sell. There will be a process. It will be a time, you know, that period that they'll have to follow through this process, I'm sure, because there will be serious downward pressure on the market if they have to liquidate all of that. I know that you each have different opinions on how that would happen, but let's just say it does go to exchanges there will be agreements with the exchanges they'll probably take custody of those assets they will probably um then liquidate those assets there may be other ways that you guys would want to speak about but the fact is is that no matter what if sixty five thousand dollars comes from one person and goes to the market for sale that's a lot more downward pressure than it goes to thousands of people and some of them hold some of them <laughs> <laughs> but cold storage, whatever they're going to do. Some of them just set it and forget it. They don't care. And others sell. Um, that's a lot different. It's this distributed selling pressure is much broader than if one major entity is in a distressed situation to sell. So I understand why there's some of that FUD. On the other side of the coin, if you're in crypto today, and you're new at crypto today, you're getting used to the, the extreme ups and downs, the roller coaster effect. This is not stable like some other mediums you might be um, participating in. Crypto can have huge ups and downs. So going from 70,000 to 59,000 to me, I didn't even pay attention. Not because it doesn't affect me, it's because how many times has a, has a change like that happened to each of us in the time that we've been here? It's huge. I don't see that. I don't freak out. It's different. Yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's a long term I, I, vision. Biggs just slipped a paper to me under the table here. Um, so, like, <laughs> I, and I think it's interesting to to kind of go over. So, uh, all, almost a million B, uh, BTC got lost. So, nine hundred forty thousand got lost. Uh, and they recovered 141,000, almost 142,000. Mm -hmm. So, so that's good, uh, and that's why that number is what's available. Um, definitely, lawyers are going to be taking some of that. What it's totally. also, I think, uh, what's also interesting, I think, is that uh, they recovered 141, 142,000 Bitcoin. But then that also means they recovered 142,000 um, BCA uh, Bitcoin Cash uh, because that split happened after. 
Um, so that's interesting too. All you know, all their clients would have gotten that Bitcoin cash. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the value maybe, of the Bitcoin cash is obviously way lower, but still. Maybe we can say a word about that because it was at the time that it it has kind of changed, right? Like it's not. We don't have forks of Bitcoin everywhere popping up, forks of important coin popping up. But mm-hmm. there was a time where if somebody was forking um, a somewhat important crypto, then everybody was interested in getting this crypto because then you would have the same the mm-hmm. same crypto, like the same amount on that on that copied blockchain with yeah. some few some few changes. And a BCH is one of those like that. Yeah. Yeah. So there are others. They're just so insignificant. But they're so matter. valueless. So the only other one I can think of, although I think BSV forked from BCH, didn't it? Wow. Not, not I, I paid little to no attention after me how many years? After four years, you expect yeah. me to remember a, a coin I could care less about. <laughs> well, they make I, I really don't I, care. I, I hear anything you, related I hear. to anything I, related to that stuff. I'm sorry I brought up the bad coin. <laughs> no, I, I look, yeah, but look, a coin is a coin is a to, is a to, token. There a was token a time theirs, but the fork care. was the new meme, the new meme yeah. coin, you know, right. like the ICO yeah. was the new meme coin. It's like, like there was the fork period, the fork mm-hmm. cycle. There was, you're right. <laughs> but anyway, it was something. But anyway, you know, I hope I hope people get their Bitcoin. Um, I hope they keep it. Uh, but uh, I, I think I, hope- I think that's one of the things that that we've been hearing. There are individuals that, at least, I'm aware of, and I think you guys are too. They um, there are some situations to where, if you have lost Bitcoin, I'm going to pull back a little bit as I'm stuttering through that. If you have a situation to where you have. Bitcoin at Mount Gox and they've rejected you, you need to have documentation. You need to have that original email and you may need to have an attorney because I do know that there are some people who have the email chain, have the validation, have the confirmation of receipts and deposits and still own addresses related to their transactions at Mount Gox, both in and out. And, um, they're being rejected and it i don't know why or what it's i don't have anything this is knowledge you receive from a person but if you're in that situation the only way that you're going to be served if you believe that to be true is you need some you need a legal person to help you <laughs> there's right. no way there's no other right. way and i find you're it gonna interesting be able to do this because on your own. you can see that if you read the news um i think nobody really talks about the Bitcoin cash part. And in Mm. fact, it's like 45 million right now, right? So there is the same risk for those um, Bitcoin cash than the Bitcoin, but the Bitcoin are valued at 6 billion. So obviously if that comes to the market, the 44 million are now irrelevant, but 44 million on Bitcoin cash is not nothing. That's true, that's true. 44 million Bitcoin cash. (laughs) Downward pressure for BCH. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no one is talking about no this one. That's about really that. what yeah. I wanted to highlight. I, I, I thought it was interesting. While the risk is probably higher than the Bitcoin one in, in reality. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, so they get from the 140 and then there is um, some cut. I'm not familiar with completely the whole process, how it went. But basically, they are deducting some fees, I would assume, and they call it early payout. Um, and then at the end, they get to about 95,000 Bitcoin, um, out of, among which 65,000 are going to individuals. So that's, uh, that's yep. the document that we have. Um, we'll see how it happens. But yeah, it's supposed to happen like in the next few weeks, I believe, right? I can't yep. remember the date. If I've seen a date somewhere. We'll probably return to it in our little podcast here because uh yeah. the, the end result may be different than what everything we know right now to at least right. to some degree so let's talk about the another aspect of crypto that is super important is uh like what what tether is doing um like mm-hmm. I, I mean it's part it's part of the backbone of the entire of the entire crypto market we just have to you know face that and i i like it um yeah i know that there's a lot of uh concern and worry about tether but after all of these years uh, you know, it's, it, 
it seems to be as solid as any other stable coin uh, <laughs> or fiat currency. <laughs> so, <Sure. laughs> um, right. but they it's not the first time they've done this either. Remember they had Omni and yeah, right. they migrated off of Omni. Yeah. And of course there's still transactions probably doing redemption with the Omni. Right. So I didn't even get to the part where, uh, what they're doing. So they, 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 <laughs> Sorry. Uh, they that's okay. They, 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 they're not supporting EOS and they're not supporting Algorand anymore. Um, and it's the same thing as you just said, right? It's, it's just lack of, of, uh, of utility there, or, you know, maybe volume is the right word. Uh, and people are using it in other places. Um, it's shocking to me, I honestly, that because they use it on, um, Tron, uh, that's that's one of the its biggest use cases it's on massive Tron now, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and Tron is a is a it's not even a, it's barely a fork, right? It's a copy of EOS. Um, and that's the part I'm just like, how did EOS lose this? <laughs> you lose that, that 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 use case. Um, so that was surprising to me. Um, but yeah, that, they, uh, so they stopped there. Yeah, that's that's still interesting. I think um, yeah, I read that the volume that they had, I think. Both the whole the whole volume um, on both of that was like less than one point five percent of the overall uh, USDT right. volume. So obviously for Tether it was more work uh, than anything to totally. keep those things going. And a couple of months ago they also uh, started to support uh, Tone, the Telegram, you know, the mm -hmm. Telegram blockchain token uh, network. I mean that thing has been uh, gaining a lot of traction uh, since the beginning of the year. And, and yeah, it was added in a lot of places and it looks like now Tether has been supporting it for a couple of months. And I think that they are a kind of restructuring themselves and uh, making sure they don't waste resource where it's, it doesn't make sense. And then they focus on what actually has a potential. Yeah, yeah I mean, think about it. go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say ETH has always been their go-to, right? I mean, that was their main tokenization after omni i think i don't think there was anything in between um i don't think eth is going anywhere i know that they're on other chains i know that tron is there because of course most people as we could all state that the fees are an issue on ethereum uh so tron um has sort of a, a much <laughs> a much lower uh, a cost of use than it would be in ethereum but um, yeah, it doesn't make sense to be on or in or participate in chains where your volume is nothing. Why, Who's why it? support those issues? And just think about why? the support, right? So on every exchange that that coin appears on, correct, where it has paired with Tether, they have to support that. The, the Tether has to be worth a dollar, right? And so, correct. I, and yeah, it's automated to a degree, but you know, you and I both know how often things just fail. Um, and they sure. can't fail. And so well, everything is redundant and they have to, that's, it's a ton of, uh, resources oh, to, yeah. ma to maintain, a, a, uh, yeah. a pairs and keep tether worth a dollar the whole time. And they have uh, to rebalance, right? The more network yeah. they have, the more now they have to be active to make sure that liquidity is matching because otherwise they would have many problems. They have to work with exchanges and all that. Yeah. And so of course, supporting networks that are not as popular is is not worth it for them right yeah, like, yeah. and so i mean it's definitely sense, not yeah. a good sign for eos and algorand like it's definitely not a good not. news for them but yeah, I, yeah to me that's i mean to me if you've had it and you lose it that's it that is to me that's a pretty huge issue uh there are other coins right and i mean i guess as long as you're trading against bitcoin also that's good but uh it's that's a that's a that's a big pretty big blow i think yeah I, um, I don't know if there is a cost i don't know if um tether is asking any fee to do any of that i don't know yeah. if um but at the end of the day if um if it is not a fee situation but it's a tether yeah. decision it's the opinion of tether right tether mm -hmm. consider that um, <clears throat> maybe those two networks have less potential than um the telegram one but i mean it doesn't mean that it's the case it's just telegram yeah. uh, it's just but, but the other thing is that it's still you know, those coins or whatever can still trade against tether uh they just the tether you have that you're trading against isn't 
<laughs> you know, it's Ethereum tether. It's not their I, tether. You I know? think you bring an excellent <laughs> point because I yeah. think it's still unclear for a ton of people, really. Yeah. I think that many people don't understand that the same coin can be represented on other blockchain. Yeah. And that's mm. that's really what we're talking about here for Tether. Um, there is one Tether, but in fact, there is a Tether on each of those supported chain that is the same, but not exactly the same coin, right? Like if you try to get the Tron Tether and you move it to your Ethereum wallet, you will have a problem. You will not see, Correct. You will not so, see this so Tether. Basically, you have Omni, which was on Bitcoin. You have you have USDT, which was on Ethereum. You had US. You had Tether on Avalanche, Tether on Cosmos, mm -hmm. Tether on Cello, Cello, however you want to say it. Then you had Tron and EOS, and there's it's even on Liquid. It's on Algorand. I mean, we can keep going down the list. Solana, all the way down to Ton, Tezos too. It's it literally exists. So if you have a billion dollars in in assets, you can divide that 250 million on one blockchain, 250 million on another blockchain, 250 million on another blockchain, and it's represented. So, but they are separate tokens. Neegs is right. Yeah. That confuses a lot of people. Oh yeah, I think it's a garbage. Yeah. I honestly, to, to be strong about it, I think that's a garbage system. Like I think so. I've got USDT in on on chain one, and I'm trying to pay somebody else who doesn't take it on that chain. So I got to get. I got to send it to somewhere else <laughs> that represents both chains, so that I can True. send it in and then send it out to the person I want to send it to. So it's just. And you're I mean, going to pay honestly, a fee from ERC twenties to Tron, yeah, if, <laughs> so right? Then you lose right, a little if you bit. End up, if, if the person you're sending it to ends up on the ERC twenty, you're paying that anyway, and now you're paying more. It's not much more, but you're paying more, and, and it's just complicated. Um, so that sure, but I, it, it's still a way to be there, right? Like without that, um, then you couldn't have USDT on that other chain, and then you would have to support the USDT. If it, it makes things more practical, I understand it does. that. And, and, and it can keep things on the chain, right? So, like, you can have. Uh, I remember when I was using EOS, there was EOS only exchanges, and so because uh, all the tokens that were on EOS were exchanged on those right. those EOS only exchanges, so it, it makes sense that it was on different different that it's on different chains for that reason. And I think it's still the case, right? Like if you have an exchange that is more than just EOS, then right. it means that there is a technology in between that connects those two because totally. there yeah. is no interoperability there. Uh, not yet. We're not, we're not there yet. Correct. <laughs> we're coming. So it, goes but... into, it goes into yeah. a, 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 an address on that one chain and on an address on the other chain, it comes out. So it's, yeah. it's, the, it is not really cross-chain communication definitely not and, it, no. and so it's not the end of the world but you can still have pairs with with tether it's just it's definitely a signal that your chain is not active like it's definitely right like, so yeah to, to maybe to clarify that so what will happen is pair from eos to tether will happen but then a pairing with the usd on eos or the usdt mm -hmm. on algorand will not be available anymore. Like when you are on the exchange, you'll not be able to withdraw that. Um, if you have a balance, I would assume because Terra is a very centralized company. So I would assume that they work with the exchange so that if you have that, you can always be able to convert it to a supported USDT. Yeah. I, don't, I don't doubt it. That is so, the process. You will have time that you can migrate it out. What they'll, I'm obviously, the the uh, smart contracts, however it's written, they could then take control of that token because that's what it is. They can take control of that token, burn that token, right? And now that that fiat that they had or whatever that asset they had that was allocated, then they can now remint if they're being ethical about it. That's that's the auditing concerns, right? Then they can remint an equivalent asset on another chain, right? It's about that pairing of fiat with their token, right? right? So there is a time frame. So if you have some of that, make sure that you follow up, check with your blockchain of choice, Algorand, EOS, or Tether, and see what their process is for you to 
migrate out. It would probably be handled by the exchanges too. A lot of them automate that process. Just yeah, that's what I think will happen. Yeah, I think that's, that's kinds of things. Users will barely um, see anything. If, if they have a balance in that token, they might actually directly talk, send them a notification that by that sure. date, they'll be converted to that other token. Because, you know, on exchange, they, you don't hold the funds. They, they do it. So mm. it's very easy to for them to just convert them to another exactly. work want, hand in hand with uh, the Tether Foundation or that's exactly. the Tether company. I hope, not a, mm -hmm. hope there's not a window, or hope maybe Tether does this because I hope like you know in three a lot of people will just have stuff in their wallets and forget about it. I, I hope. I hope I'm there's sure, a way. <laughs> I'm sure the validity for it, right? of those tokens is um, not at risk, right. but they're not minting new ones. Right. So oh, I think I they'll still accept uh, for you to send them back Swap, to get. Yeah. USD or another correct uh, USDT, yeah. but but they will not refuse it. I, I I've not seen that anywhere. Yeah, that there was a, very a note that I have the the time frame on that. I think there was a date. Date 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 date. Uh, they will be okay. So the exact verbiage was. While no new USDT will be minted on these blockchains, existing tokens can still be redeemed for the next twelve months. There you go. There okay. is a window. Yes, wow. there is a window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I stated wow. it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So pay attention to your Algorand and EOS <laughs> Tether and swap it out. <laughs> swap it out. That's but right. Mix is right. If it's Might actually tied over the exchanges like have that. Tether because Tether, as far as I understand, has got an agreement with exchanges that offer Tether where they loan that Tether to the exchange. And so they'll those exchanges will probably handle it. But do your own research, right? You know that that acronym for it. Do your own research. Communicate with the exchange where you have your Algorand or EOS Tether. If it's in a self-custody wallet, self-custody wallets will not automatically convert. You'll want to get it somewhere to convert it. That's right, and Hi. the next uh, next topic is uh, CBDC. Everybody yeah. loves them. Yeah, let's talk. About oh yeah, that they're my favorite. Because that seems to be there's some ha some stuff happening here. Um, actually, Niggs, you want to talk about the EU here since you live there? Uh, sure. Yeah, we can start that. <laughs> not actually, not exactly. I'm just like I'm surrounded by EU. Oh, fair enough. But I'm not. Yeah. I'm not exactly in EU, right? I'm in the <laughs> geographical EU, but not yes, <laughs> not the political. Fair not that I don't <laughs> suffer from it, but that's another topic. <laughs> but yeah, so um, so EU is trying to um, address the concern about privacy. There have been, a, I guess, I guess everybody knows that there are a lot of concern about what would happen with CBDCs, which are just to remind everybody a totally centralized. Uh, pseudo cryptocurrency that is controlled by uh, the government right Correct. so obviously um as it is extremely anti crypto for anyone who is a little bit familiar with crypto um there is a lot of concern about uh, the control of those government on crypto which is again the whole idea of having crypto and being sovereign over your funds and so they're trying to address those questions and they're trying to add some privacy rulings and basically trying to convince people that uh, those CBDC will will still protect them and will be used uh, almost like cash. And uh, it doesn't seem very believable, to, if you if, ask me. If we think about it, well, Tether is huge. USDC is huge. Those are, those are non-governmental organizations, businesses that have a digital token, right? It's not too far different except what both of those entities and other entities like them they try to balance that against a, a representative asset right people some people have tried to do that with gold and all sorts of things when you're talking about central banks and digital currencies you're talking about organizations the central banks are used to fiat printing they're used to balancing currency by making more from nothing this is the danger in these central bank digital currencies is it's no different than the paper currencies that people have now, but it's 
actually far more dangerous. It's far less privacy concern. You know, it's far less privacy in those currencies. And if, and then even further, there's a huge problem with potential censorship. Central banks and digital currencies are dangerous. There's, I'm very anti those currencies. So, so. so, I mean, that's important, right? So we talk about how Tether is centralized. It absolutely is. There's absolutely. not even, that's not a question. But what Tether can't do is, because they're relying on the blockchains themselves, um, is that they can't say, you can't spend this here, right? They can't, like Tether, there's no enforcement of, of Tether, right? Whereas when you have, we can get into the, the technical details a little bit, but um, when you have a CDBC, Governments are not just used to just printing money. It's not just inflation that's really the issue. The governments are used to absolutely controlling whether you can or can't have access to your money. So as an Correct. example, in Cyprus about a decade ago, maybe a little bit more, they just took 10% of everybody's money. Uh, they just took it. Mm -hmm. And they'll be able to do that with CDBCs. In India, they said, "You're here, we're, we're redoing all the money. The old money is no good. You got to use the new money. And... We will decide whether uh, when you try to exchange your money, if the old one is value, you got to tell us where it came from. Yeah. Like, do you know where the $10 came from that's in your money, in your wallet right now? I, it, like, so it's, it's, it's games. I call them games, but it's evil. <laughs> it's games like that that they're used to having. And what CDPCs are allowing them to do now are not just able to inflate the money, not just able to control, take it if they want it not just able to uh, prevent you from spending it. It's just, they, it gives them new powers that maybe we haven't even thought of yet. Every oh single goodness. dollar right. that you think is in your wallet will not be yours. It will be theirs. Um, and the privacy part, that's kind of funny, right? So I'm just going to dive a little bit into, because uh, <laughs> I've been looking into this for a couple of years now. Um, I'm not saying that all governments are going to use this platform, but there's, there's a platform called Corda. It's made by a consortium called R3, which is, I believe it's a hundred banks that got together mm -hmm. in 2014. So it's not like, you know, banks are just coming aboard here. In 2014 is when this came together and they, they didn't take on blockchain technologies. There's blockchain is a digital ledger technology. So digital ledger is very well, generic. A digital ledger isn't a blockchain, but well, blockchains do have be. digital ledgers. Well, uh, so D DLTs, uh, blockchain is a DLT, but it's a specific kind where, where, it's, where the transactions are in blocks and the blocks are linked together. But DLTs can be anything. Um, it could as long as there's a ledger and it's digital, it can be anything. So that's what, um, so they, you hear a lot of conflation about from the court of people or the R3s about how, oh, blockchain's a DLT and this is a DLT and they're trying to conflate it. It is not the same thing because a DLT can, it's not, the court of system is not a single database, but it could be. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, it could be a single node. And in fact, it's possible for Corda, the way it works is that it has these notary nodes Mm -hmm. A very small group of nodes are doing all the verification of all the transactions. It also can do all the censorship of the transactions. It can also control the fund flow of all of everything that happens. Um, and they've done a lot of work putting making platforms that make it easier for businesses to get uh, on digital versions of currency. It already exists. It's already used in England. It's or the technology, not the central, not not the CDBC. Um, but the platform, in terms of moving money around in the same sort of way of moving Tether around, is already being used around the world. Uh, you can go to their website and see some use cases. So the key here is that now the UAE was looking at Corda for their CDBC, uh, CBDC, yeah. Um, and the yeah. latest one is Ethiopia, actually. Yeah. Uh, e Ethiopia uh, is also researching uh deployment for their CDBC, um, either to become part of BRICS or on their own. I'm not really sure about that yet. I don't think they are. It's all research at this moment. But that's how that's working. And that's the technology that's really first in line for uh, deployment of CDBCs. Uh, I can't believe I'm going to say this uh, because I hate all politicians, but I'm happy Trump is getting behind the idea of not having them here. Um, 
it's That's already right. very it, it doesn't I mean, like it's it, already, yeah go ahead it, it doesn't sound like it's his idea but i'm right. very glad that <laughs> he's supporting that yeah. um because it is actually appearing everywhere right like we see ethiopia but it is really everywhere and look um to get back to the ecb like the european central bank um, yeah attempt to try to address those concerns so they are trying to tell us that it, they want to offer cash like level of privacy so i don't know if you're familiar with uh, central banks and how they <laughs> would want your cash to be tracked and your personal transactions and yeah. your sales of something like your car to your friend or anything like they would want to have everything so but then now they're telling you like yeah but we have this great opportunity, but we won't seize it. We'll do everything so that everything we have wanted, we can have it, but we will do everything to lose it. So you can, yeah, you can be sure yep. it won't happen. Like yeah. those things are extremely invasive. It, it's funny you, because, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, if you give the control. Blockchain is supposed to be in the hands of everybody. And that's, that's how it is important. If you give that, like it's already very public, so it has some downsides about that. Um, even if there will, there have there, it exists some technologies that actually counter that. And of course, they're not really welcome by um, the you know the authorities. We talked about that last yeah. time with the samurai wallet. But mm -hmm. at at the end of the day, if you give the whole control. To the centralized government, they'll do what they do best. They'll abuse of it, and that's yeah, that's correct. what will happen. So when you when you look seat. at Corda in in support of yeah. what you're saying, when you look at Corda and in support of what Rob is saying, Corda transactions are set up in a way that there's no complete record of the transaction visible to all participants. That means everyone. Instead, it 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 only the party's part of that transaction, but here's the catch. This is like trust minimized or we don't permanently store your private keys, mm -hmm. those kinds of statements. It also no, shares a, that with specific regulatory organizations, mm -hmm. governmental, all of that relevant data <laughs> is available. No, yeah, that's there that's, is no privacy at all that, in that. And I'm not saying that you need privacy i'm saying you have no reason unless i deem it for you to be able to do see what i'm buying you don't need to know that i'm buying corn or potatoes or whatever i'm buying and you can't you shouldn't be able to stop me from pumping gas into my car or or you know because of whatever reason i shouldn't have to be in that situation now that's different from things like Hyperledger and those kinds of things, but all of them are just more or less distributed ledger technologies. We, I'm going to bring this back to sidechains for a second. Sidechains can give a closed blockchain to a business and those people um, that are participating in that business, that's a that's a utility function, but in this case it's it's different because even, even as that side chain is deployed, that side chain will still have validators. It will still have uh, people volunteering. Yes, they still get paid, but they volunteer to operate that node in that situation um, and support that, that utility function for that business. This is really weird. This is, this is creating a database making sure that I can see my payment coming in, but also everybody else that is in a specific regulatory situation can also see what's coming in. I, I think that there's privacy problems with that. Now, they we did vote to restrict. I th think there was a passing, right? Do you, do you remember? I think that there was a vote and they voted, at least in the US, to have privacy guidelines applied to CBDCs if said CBDCs came. But I find that to be malarkey. I don't think we can trust anything, anybody, any politician can state as far as our privacy is concerned. There's lots of things we'll talk about as we go along, but any of these kinds of technologies, I think everybody can hear my tone. I am very anti all of these technologies. 
these are I mean, dangerous. At the end, it's always the same, right? They tell you, yeah, we will respect all your privacy. Everything will be done to protect you. And then they come with always the same card. Yeah, but now it's anti-money laundering. It's uh, anti-terrorism founding. Now give us all your information. No, no, you, we respect your privacy, but just give us access to everything just to protect the world. It's always it's always <laughs> the same excuse, right? Give us all and, your information. And at the end of the day, those guys are never arrested, right? It's exactly like the the gun situation, right? They want to prevent gun, but uh, criminals they always have gun. I don't understand how it works, right? They don't <laughs> yeah, follow we're the go laws. Down another rabbit hole. So, yeah, that's true. But I mean, it's it's kind of the same thing, right? They always tell you that you will be protected, but at the end of the day, you can never trust it because they come with a new excuse to now get access to everything and. Um, I mean, I think that we've seen, especially in the last decade, the uh, situation with censorship, the coercion, like people, like in nowadays, you don't kill people you disagree with, you make sure that they don't have financial means, right? And exactly. so CBDC is another tool for them to to enhance their control over, over people. So definitely a thing to be, yeah, to be we careful can, we, about. We can see that what, I don't know the powers that be if they don't like you for some reason I think it's consistent across all cultural all governments all countries what what it seems to be that is that people are getting taken to court and they are losing millions or billions or it could be if you're the small person there's lots of funny YouTube videos you can watch out like that even if you're falsely accused, they take everything from you, from things. They take it all. And then you have to try to get it back. It's, it's very, very nefarious what, uh, what happens. There's very right. little that has to be done to just destroy your life. And, and it, even if it you makes feel it very you're on the right pain. side, at the end of the day, those things change very quickly. When the, <clears throat> sorry, when the, that level of power um, gets like when you get to that level of power, it's dangerous for everybody. It right? is, yeah. yes. So yeah, I think we can move to the next to the I next think topic. So. Yeah. I think so. What is it? The website refresh. Oh, website yeah. refresh. Yeah. I'll start with that if you want to help me here, Nudes sure. and Rob. Okay. I'll, I think I think this is this is an important important. Imp I, I can't underscore how important it is. The website has gone through phases in time, all the way from 2017, late 2017 to today. And I think it's been framed in different ways where I think the, the website started off as seriously focused on crypto made easy and marketplaces. And then we went through a phase to where it was more SaaS oriented because of uh, the persons involved, you know, creating the website and had direction on the website. Divi is a blockchain. And I think we're going to return. That's the whole goal of the new website is returning to focusing on the blockchain. We're focusing on the utility, focusing on the use cases, focusing on the why you should have Divi as part of your platform in the future when we have all of these things come to be, um, why it's important to have an updated site because the flows, the style, the culture, the way that we use websites has changed. We need to make sure that information about the why for Divi is for, it's, it's a, at the forefront of, of, of that, even in the flow in the website, it should be focused on making sure how we can get the most views, um, how the brand of Divi, if we use that in the most general sense, because because we are all Divi, um, what it means to to participate as a validator, future advanced vaults, if you want to call them that. I think we have articles on that. How that's so important for what. Um, new users, um, even current users can share that information because that information should be in a, a format that is easily shareable, easily consumable, easily explainable, and it needs to look professional. It, it's got to feel right. And I don't think that our current website, the one we have now, which was done, what, a one and a half years, two, two years ago, 
it's ever done that. And I think that's why it's so important that we need to update that. I don't know. I kind of got that's, in sales mode. Neegs, what, what, what no, would you no, that, add to that? That was good. So I think, I think it's important to, um, look into how others do it, right? Like if you look around on other websites for, uh, competing, competing, uh, projects, um, and you will see that you have a lot of pretty colors and, um, interesting shapes. Like the, the website are pretty attractive. They look very professional. Sure. And I think we're lacking some of that on the current website. Uh, as you mentioned, it was done on a period where, um, we didn't have that much headroom to be able to go through the website. I mean, there are a ton of really important information on the website, but I think it is lacking this uh, somewhat impressive, attractive way, right? Like the, the information should be delivered in mm -hmm. a way that is interesting and that is like people are very visual and especially today with the kind of content that people consume and the website is the first thing that people go to when they discover your brand, right? Absolutely. They hear about the brand, they they directly go see the website, go what what it is about and see what it is doing and where it is going, right? And so that's exactly where we want to go with this new website. Um, so we published an article that is going through uh, the elements that we're talking about now, but also uh, you can have the draft model of the website we want to we want to have and so some of the key points that we want to have is of course the home page that will basically be the center point for the whole website we want to have a section there for uh, all the rest of the website but we also want to highlight the dv blockchain i think um, it is something that is uh, greatly missing on the current website we have Absolutely. to explain why we are different um we have to talk about the staking votes, the large read, the subscription, uh, the light. We like we have to talk about everything that makes our blockchain um, a great option, especially with the sidechain coming. And then um, I also thought that, and we're connecting with uh, Jeff and Nick for that. But I also want to have like a full history from the early days, pre ICO days to to today especially yeah. with like different people um impacting the development of of dv a lot of different story including crazy ones from the beginning i think it would be great to have that on the website links to videos and all that so yeah so that and i think one of the thing and i think it was um you who propose it but i'm not sure um we also want to have buy options on the website yes Definitely. yes yeah it should yeah. be it should be right there prominent because we have the ability to use um change now right that's one thing and then there may be another option coming in the future obviously it could be i'm mentioning this out loud but i'm not guaranteeing it but it could be that there is something going on with um uh divi swap right we should have those kinds of things but change now could be implemented so that people can on board easily in in the website right there and now i think that would be great um sorry rob I, I you were gonna say something and i'll stop so oh that was in the last topic <laughs> <laughs> they're buying on buying yeah, yeah on no board. not on buying but um like we definitely need to have that on there uh but the other things that i thought would be neat, neat is because we repeat it a lot when we speak but we we talk about like you know, wh where's Divi being used? And we, yeah. we, there is, there are places. It's not on the website very much. It's not, at least it's not highlighted in, in any, in big details, uh, in a way to understand that, you know, Divi is utilized in a number of places, in games, in, 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 uh, in Lightning Works comics, uh, and a few other places. And I think we just need to highlight it somewhere. So that, that's going to be on the website right. too. That's I right. There is yeah, a page for right. that. I think, and that is, then yeah. there should also be an encouragement, even on the website, that if you'd like to and have a business or have something you'd like to offer and um, receive payment in, in Divi, we're talking about a value transfer utility, right? That mm -hmm. should be that should be there too. I mean, so if we yeah. list people, we should also have find out how. It should be all those kinds of things can be there. Um, yeah. Neegs, I was going to say that part of the history, can we have a section on beta bashers? That would be awesome. Of course. We I think, I think we should have sections for everything Man. we can actually <laughs> post there. I think there is a ton to, to share that is interesting, that yeah. makes us look also more relatable 
And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Um, go read that article on the website. Teed, um, the model that, that we have, the drive that we have. Don't hesitate mm -hmm. to provide feedback. We'll be happy to hear anything. Um, and then I think we can go to the toughest part, which is the cost. So the cost of that, right? Yeah. So um, we looked into multiple partners and I think we find um, probably one of the best offer possible. And we were able to find that um, they would be able to achieve that for a budget of about $5,000. Mm -hmm. um, so the objective is up to 14 pages. Um, again, all of that is in the article. So I really invite you to go there, but I really want to remind again that, um, that is critical. Uh, the website is critical to be able to then move to next step and do the paid marketing, which is something that we'll talk about right after, but those $5,000, I think can be easily achieved, uh, if we work together. And, and then we would have like really a beautiful website, a beautiful new website. And now if we do any different, you know, marketing, um, mar marketing, we have a marketing opportunity, we do any initiative, uh, then it would pay a lot more because basically every time someone is reached by your marketing campaign, the first thing they, they do is go to your website, right? So we really need to have a killer website. And so that's why we're going through the DAO to raise those five thousand dollar, and yeah, we hope to get your support on that. Yeah, it would be nice. I mean, it doesn't take very many people to um, put in a little bit of money and get there. I mean, a hundred people could get that done for very little. If it's twenty people, it's a little bit more, but it's not spread apart. All of us, it's not a big deal. That's right, and I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, I think that it is important to understand that it is in the interest of everybody, right? If we're able Absolutely. to have a good website and then establish a marketing strategy, um, we'll all feel much better after that. Yeah. Um, I think it will bring a lot of eyes. That, I think that's yeah, an attitude that we don't delineate enough. And it's like, you know, the three of us are trying to do this work here. We use a lot of our time and, and you know, we spend a little, we spend money on stuff. Uh, but our entire idea here is that if we can if we can spend a little money uh the reward not not given to us but the reward is that the value of the stuff that we own goes up um it doesn't always happen but because we're doing this repeatedly consistently uh we're doing we want to do the we want to do different aspects uh like the website's one the DAO's another maybe more exchanges more tools all of these things pile up and and that's the value that goes in, that becomes our coin as we get more and more note um uh recognition uh that's these small amounts of money that we could each be paying for these relatively large steps um are will return our money in the value of uh that's of, right of coins <laughs> the money is a little bit yeah. more edgy right the price but yeah. what is sure is that the interest right and and yeah. they're obviously directly connected right but if we have a good website if we're yeah. able to start marketing campaign and reach outside of our community the result is a bigger community some new people that are interested and and of course that that should uh, reflect on all the other aspects of the project obviously yeah i mean yeah, anything I think that takes work right or any, most anything that you put work into and that people want you know that that's how value is actually defined. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so, Correct. <laughs> and it's it's not a shill. It, we're talking about what Divi is, what Divi can be, why Divi, all of those things, and why we also participate in Divi. The website helps us. And just as it would be anything, if you're excited about it, as I am, and I think that you guys are, um, mainly because I think we also get to work in it, which helps with that level of... <clears throat> that that injection of steroid that makes you really excited about it um, is the fact that it's great to share. It's it's great to share that information. It's great to make it easily available. It's great to have others with us that participate and build a, a, upon these current offerings and the upcoming current offerings. I think it's great to have a good website. That's right. And so we will hammer it. Uh, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised uh, if we hammer it in Discord um, if we post on social media, like we, 
we really need your support on that. I mean, obviously, we will have some uh, critics. I mean, it's normal. I understand some people are less familiar with the situation. They they imagine that things are like we have infinite amount of money to cover for that. Um, again, if you have questions for that, you can go back to the articles that we posted on the blog where we share the numbers and how the foundation is operating and you will have some clarity about that. Um, again, we, we really need the help of the community for that. So we'll be hammering on the on this topic. And then... Um, Maybe I misunderstood I, you, but I, I heard you say we have an infinite amount of money for that. No, we, we <laughs> actually do say. not. It's definitely not true. <laughs> yeah, we, we have an we infinite amount of work do to do. We, so, <laughs> yeah. And, and again, I think it's critical to have that to go to the next step, which is um, the paid marketing, um, where... Oh, yeah. I can, like, I remind that we posted the first article on that. Um, again, I send everybody to to this article. We'll post it again. Uh, make sure you read it. It's a very interesting yeah. inter article, gonna, article, gonna, article about the behind the scene. Rock and roll. So I, I'll, I'll drill, I have some more articles coming out where I drill down further into it. So those will be important also. But yeah, I mean, if if we want this, you know, it, marketing is the way. We have we have to pay for this. So that's, that's, this is the way, uh, it's going to cost some money up front. Hopefully we can all get together, get a new website up, uh, get some marketing paid for, maybe even get an exchange. We we'll talk about exchanges. Oh yeah. So about for the, those articles, so you will talk a little bit more in detail, right? Just yeah. before we, we move on. Okay. And yeah. so, and so after that, um, once everybody will have the proper information to be to make an educated vote, then we can move that to the DAO, decide the kind yep. of strategy we want to put in we place. So make sure you read those articles. We'll also be hammering those because we want want people to understand how it's happening so that we can move forward together with people that are a lot more understanding what is happening and and yeah, we can we can move forward and Let's let's go to the exchange listing topic. That's I think that's an interesting topic. That's a good one. That's a good one. Definitely. And I think it completes the whole thing. Yeah, because we definitely like getting a stale website, getting a having a stale set of exchanges. It just feels funny, right? Like a new exchange, like a new website, is just uh, like it, uh, it. There's a sense of excitement about it, I should say. So we would like to do uh, definitely a new exchange. And so, Neegs, you've been doing a lot of research on different That's ones. Right. We've mentioned some before, but you've done a lot more work on this now. Yeah, yeah. So let me let me start uh, set the situation. So first of all, I think there are a few things to acknowledge or understand about the exchange um, landscape. So I think that we can easily say that among the first uh, 50 or 100, the top 100 exchanges, the amount of exchange requiring KYC is just ever increasing. It is, it is yes. crazy. Um, it is becoming a lot more difficult to be able. And I mean, it was expected that the situation will become more and more strict. So we only have actually a few options. And it's not that we are against KYC, but you're probably also familiar with the fact that those exchange also refuse U.S. customers. So that yeah. is a major problem for us. We want a U.S. customer to be able to access exchange. But again, our research show that it is uh, it is not going to be something that is going to calm down. Uh, quite the opposite. Um, the possibility for non-KYC exchange will keep shrinking down. So we have to be we have to be extremely smart for that. And so one thing that um, people kind of, I think, are not, not comfortable with or are less comfortable with is that they're calling for those big name exchanges, but they're actually the one who are restricting people with KYC, restricting U.S. customers. So at the end of the day, they they won't, won't get what they want. And so what we saw is that if you actually want that, we should probably go to smaller exchanges. Um, yes, and it is also um, that is also a price concern. Like there are um, major differences in price, and I think that uh, maybe I, I can talk about that. But maybe you want to talk about the price range that we have in the top hundred exchanges and the kind of uh, the kind of situations that we have with U.S. exchange, top ten exchange, and the kind of offers that we we have. Yeah. 
Uh, UX exchanges continue to be very difficult um, I, I, to get onto for a variety of reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. But definitely the biggest one, is, I think the biggest one is that they require a volume um, that we, do, we don't have. They, 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 uh, and frankly, I'm sure the bigger coins and the newer coins are just paying for volume. Uh, or the fact that they're new is is creating that volume, and they can they can achieve that um, that kind of metric and and to be get to be able to get on these uh, American exchanges easier. We don't have that, um, and but I think the one thing to oh well, before I go into that um, there it, it doesn't mean that those the even the low end of the top fifty or top hundred uh, exchanges are cheap to get on. No matter what, there's there's a payment, um, and I think there's a range of like sixty thousand to three hundred thousand just to get mm -hmm. on there, um, and then there's other costs. Uh, we still you still got to pay for market makers. You still there's other costs sometimes involved with being on the exchange that they like to see. Um, so it's definitely <laughs> it's it's definitely a big hurdle to get over. Um, that's it's, right. So some of those exchanges want several hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you want to go in the top 10 or US exchange, as you were mentioning, it's actually not necessarily linked to an amount you will have to pay. You will yeah. have to pay a large amount. Don't get me yeah. wrong, but Always. it is not the only requirement. Um, they want you to be important, right? Let's yes. be clear. They want your coin to be important. And that's something we can expect to reach when we have the side chains. But right now, that would be unrealistic to, to expect that. Um, so as you mentioned, between 60,000 and 300,000, we could say for the exchange that are between place 100 and place uh, 11, right? Mm -hmm. And so these account for listing uh, any operation that they would have and then also providing liquidity because I think something that people are not uh, familiar with in crypto is that projects have to provide liquidity on exchange, right? Like it's not, you can't just have a pair, especially on the biggest ones, you can't just have a pair and then let things be organic. You actually have to provide liquidity on both sides to be mm -hmm. able for people to not have like a jittery experience, right? It has to be the smoothest possible. And so this is not something that is done in other kind of markets, but it is the case in crypto. And so those obviously have a cost. You have, you have a cost to have the liquidity there, but then you have also an additional cost. It was the market maker that Rob was talking about earlier, yeah. where you basically have a bot that has to move around to make sure that the proper liquidity is there at the same the proper time so that people uh, can trade in and out um as smooth as possible and correct at different times of the day i mean I, exactly one, 24 one, one way somebody kind of put market making to me that that was interesting for me to understand was like it, it's so that people at at three o'clock can trade with people at six o'clock like it's it, it's uh it, it makes it so that that's what you meant by a smooth kind of experience. Like it's not just like this one that time right. of day when it's good for everybody. Um, so I think that was, so there's, there's costs associated with that. There's, you know, and, and there's organization associated with that to talk to market makers. That, that's an industry, right? There's, there are people who do that for a living, uh, companies, lots Correct. of them. One, one other thing that I think you found out was interesting is that the exchanges <laughs> that were on, Bitru, uh, Ascendex, and KuCoin, they're all top 50. Uh, they're, they're, they're not that bad. Um, That's right. And, uh, <laughs> I think even more than that, um, while KuCoin went into a very strict KYC, uh, I think last June, um, Ascendex and Btrue actually have, uh, for Ascendex, it is actually uh, totally open. I think you don't have to verify. For Btrue, there is, you need level one. However, this is just an email or a phone number. You don't have to provide an ID. So those platforms actually are, um, are actually great in our situation. Like when I was looking into potential platforms to look into and get listed, they are actually getting us some of the best platform that would suit our our case. So it is interesting. We'll see how we can develop those platforms. Uh, we were talking about market making. None of those platforms have market making actually. Well, KuCoin so, does. Sorry? 
No, Kucoin. sorry, Ascendex and yeah. Btrue I was mentioning. Yeah. Because and actually, if you want to understand the difference between market making, uh, a market a pair with market making and a pair without, go and look at Bitrue versus KuCoin. I mean, that's <laughs> now you can see the difference. That's right. Um, it, it's huge. And it's a definitely better experience on KuCoin. KuCoin was number four when we got on there. Uh, yeah, it, it was, it was down. giant. Yeah, it dropped down because uh, of, of, of governments being unhappy with them, I think. Um, and so now we're kind of looking at like what is moving up. And MEXC is looking pretty good. Um, That's we right. We have a proposal out there for that, um, I think, right? Or have we not put that out yet? That's right. So MEXC yeah. actually um, went very fast uh, since last year or something like that, um, as, especially this year. It, it is 11th now. And... KuCoin is now 10, so it is very soon going to uh, overtake KuCoin in the exchange ranking. It has um, an average reputation. It's not that it has the like it has a reputation to list everything and anything. You can find everything there. But otherwise, they've been very reliable. They actually have um, excellent conditions for, for users. They have 0% taker and maker fees. So it's, it's extremely interesting. However, they cost a little bit of money, right? Like they are 11th, they know about that. And so the, the overall listing price is 120,000, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you can add to that uh, 24,000 for market making, the same kind of service we have currently on uh, KuCoin. So that's a total of 144,000. So that's, we are conscious that it's obviously not a small number. So that will remain as a long-term um, a long-term DAO uh, collection. We'll also try to work aside to get uh, some support on that. And, and again, that's what we said earlier. Those kind of things would bring more eyes, would bring more people. And at the end of the day, kind of pays for itself, right? So Yeah, when you get on a new exchange, the exchange is just as uh, interested to promote the the arrival onto the exchange. So if we get on MEXC, yeah. the other people using MEXC are going to get notification, you know, advertising and on so forth about you know being on MEXC. Um, so that's, I mean, it, it's not just a place to trade; it's a place to get noticed also. Which is why the website should also be good <laughs> or revamped that's by right. the time we get on one of these. So they kind of it all kind of the market making, the listing. Uh, website. Uh, uh, these are all kind of working hand in hand, um, and we, you know, we know we understand it's not going to all happen at once. But that they they do work hand in hand. Exactly. That's right. And so MEXC also offers uh, thirty BTC uh, withdrawal limit per day without KYC. So that extremely welcoming, and and so we also have other options. So one of the options that. Um, we found is an exchange that is uh, 17, so not that bad. Um, so that's L Bank, and our cost would be about 60,000. So you can expect this one to also come in the DAO. We'll also propose this one. Uh, at the end of the day, the more movement we have, the more we are able to reach those exchanges, see that DV is coming back, um, the, the better it will be for everybody. So yep. this will come as proposals. I think it is. Um, it is important for DV to move forward to see some moves. And I don't have some names now because I need to do a little bit more research on smaller exchanges. But mm -hmm. you can expect that we might have proposals on exchange that are maybe ranked even lower than the top 100 to see if we can draw that, um, bring those costs down and see if you are interested. We can, we can look into all that, but that, that's pretty much the exchange topic for now. Yeah, yeah I, th I think <clears throat> if I close it out, no matter what, there is a need to be in more places. Mm -hmm. I have knowledge and experience from other industries. You never want all your eggs in one basket. You need to have more opportunities elsewhere. You can be too distributed, too spread out. So it's not just about getting more or more exchanges. It's about getting the right exchanges. It's about getting the right small exchanges. It's about getting the relationships with the right large exchanges. And then there's the reminder. An exchange like MEXC, which is very 
new up and coming, right? It's not not older like KuCoin. If you look at the exchange lists over the last five years, what was big five years ago, some of those are barely on the list anymore. What is big yesterday is not so big today. Somebody else is taking their place. So we need to be distributed amongst those. We need to be open for other opportunities. You know, so that's it's very important for us to, as a community, to be always open and thinking towards that. Nothing is fixed. Nothing is static. You should always have another opportunity. Yep. Sounds good. So yeah, I think it is all part of that overall strategy to bring to bring DV back on track. Uh, make sure that um, our new technology, our new vision, reaches more people. Uh, make sure that the community now gets back into growing, especially uh, massively. <laughs> so, and for that, we need to achieve those, right? We need to make sure we have a proper website. We need to make sure that our online presence is good, which is something that I think we achieve now. Um, and we need to make sure that there is now um, some next milestone, an exchange marketing, and that's exactly what we're going through. And this is again not even. Uh, talking about the partner and what what will be happening with those guys but i think it is also like the dv the dv side of the of of the journey and so um, i think that we can we can do that together and we'll be a lot yeah. more a lot more comfortable with um seeing that people can actually see where we're going and can share the hopes that we have for how dv and the side chains will actually change the whole industry it's the hopes we should all have, right? We're all working. Right. We're all running nodes. Some of us are hodlers. Many of us are supporting the blockchain. I heard someone we should say, all use your that. crypto. I think we have a use segment. Use your crypto, exactly. It should be at work. <laughs> <laughs> it should be at work or you should be using it to buy stuff or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we could spend a moment uh, talking about, uh, we, talk, we talked a little bit about privacy when we talked about the CDBCs, but um we should really spend a little bit of time with just about general internet privacy like uh mm. because there are, there are ways to protect yourself um from uh, just having i i think we, we generally call it hygiene and, and there's a number of things to keep your computer clean you know you could use antiviruses and things like that um, but that's a but security just, that's not a, it's a security that's a, thing remember it's, a lot enough. of people get confused yes. and i'm interjecting because i talk to a lot of people about this yep. you mention antiviruses and you mention privacy like mm -hmm. a vpn or something right um pro security is your is your windows defender security is not kapersky well I um, right now so but I your security like is your avast together. maybe not avast is your security is an antivirus a good bit defender there mm -hmm. you go um but yeah i'll let you go are you going to say something about vpn no, or something I, I, i'm getting there like i just I use the word hygiene, not security or privacy. I said privacy, but I think they, there's an overall idea of uh, using your computer, especially in the world of crypto, to help keep out the bad guys, uh, help keep yourself private, uh, and so people don't know. Like, like the worst thing I see online is you know is people telling them that they have any crypto at all. Um, you know, people can assume it, but actually saying how much or or what you have, those kind of things are are bad practices but one of the things i do um that we could, that i was hoping we could maybe spend a time on is is mm -hmm. i i basically do everything behind a vpn um you know as as much as i can if things fail because i'm on it um then i make the decision to either be uh, to go off of it because i need that thing or there's another way around uh or not use it often it's not i'm not well if i can't use my vpn i'm not using this one mm -hmm. place where you can't use vpns for example is is like when i try to access my online bank they want to make sure i'm in america so my vpns are usually i usually put my computer <laughs> route my computer traffic through something uh, either in europe uh usually europe for me um and uh, then I find that I can't use some of my banking applications. So correct. So there's places where you either have to take it down or do something different. But most of my browsing, all of my crypto, everything that I do is is behind a VPN that tells the person or that tells the website that I'm interacting with that I'm not where I am. 
Um, it also provides another layer of encryption um, be between uh, me and the uh, and the VPN uh, service that I'm using. Um, for me, uh, I run my own VPN uh, server. Uh, a lot of people use Nord and some other ones. The problem yep. I found with Nord is that there's a lot of sites that recognize Nord addresses and will still Correct. block it. Um, so I s launched my own. I've had very few problems with it. Um, it's I find it not that easy. Like <laughs> once I had I, I bought a new computer, setting stuff up on my end, uh, I had to redo it, and I hadn't had to touch it in like two years. So it's very reliable. But when you change things on your end, or you decide to just change things on your servers, and uh, you got to relearn everything, which is a pain. Whereas if you just use something like Nord, uh, you don't have to do any thinking; you can just use it. But you know, there's downsides too. Right. So, so I think I think what it should be said about Neegs is in a, a little bit different situation. But for you and I, mm -hmm. I choose European VPNs for some countries philosophy on privacy right so it's not just you're private with your vpn but a vpn is not a cloak it is like a direct tunnel to a location where you pop out in that location and then you go mm -hmm. to where you want to go most closest to wherever you popped out so nobody can see what you're doing on your way there once you're there they can see everything and you're in where you start they can see everything it's about the privacy of everything happening between those two points. I use European, um, some of the European uh, countries will have relationships with those vendors, whether it's Nord or someone else, uh, even antivirus programs offer um, uh, VPNs like Avast, but there's also free VPN. There's also, you know, all sorts of things. I also personally run my own private server, my own server that operates as a VPN, as you do. Um, and I have that server hosted in a European country. That's exactly that respects what I do. privacy. Yep. So choose something when you're using your VPN and you're using your local banking. If you're in Missouri and you're going to go to your bank, which is your local bank, it's okay to select your closest. Um, the fastest link to your VPN. If you're traveling outside of the United States and you need to get to your bank um, and you're in Europe or South America, I experience this because I travel a lot. If you try to use a VPN like Nord, and let's say you're in a country in, uh, let's say Costa Rica is an example, I couldn't even get to my bank using Nord uh, to go to my bank. I actually had to set up a remote server just kind of like the remote VPN, a remote server that I could log into and then do my banking in that state where the bank was. Otherwise, I couldn't even use VPN. So there's all sorts of hurdles you have to go through. But when you're trading, it's a lot easier. You're trading, you want to maintain your privacy. You don't want anybody to see what you're doing. You want to maintain that privacy. Uh, choose a country um, of origin that is a privacy-centered country to hook that VPN into like Switzerland or something yeah. like that. Maybe I use you Switzerland. Might have some better ideas yeah. on what those <laughs> yeah, It's be. better than EU, but yeah. because otherwise then US also has access to it again. Correct. So, yeah. <laughs> at the end of the right. day, I think what's important to understand is how, why a VPN could be important for you. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you go around on the internet, you're basically, every time you connect on a website, you're sending a bunch of data, right? Mm -hmm. Every time you connect to that website, you're sending a bunch of data. And, and if you're connected from uh, your home or your phone, and then you don't have a VPN in between, then you're basically advertising all those information to the website you're going to. And if 100%. you don't want to do that, you want to be a little bit more private. You want to make sure that you control the data that is going there. Um, one of the things that you can protect uh, with a VPN is the location you are actually uh, contacting the website from, right? Now, all your requests will be coming from that uh, third-party endpoint and all your requests will be coming from there and for the website, you will be calling from that other that other place. And so that is something that could be extremely useful. Um, I guess you've seen probably a lot of 
um, ad, a lot of ads on the internet about that. I think we don't, we should get our sponsor for VPN, it looks like. We should, yeah, we should, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the um, main thing it can is, be extremely you... practical, um, yeah. especially to make sure that you you keep your privacy or at least some part of your privacy, like your location. Yeah. You don't let other restrict your access to this thing or the other thing. Um, it gives you a lot more control than without it. Um, I'm not like Rob, I'll not use it for everything, but every time this is something I care about, I want to make sure I, I keep the control, I'll definitely use the VPN. When I use, when I used, when I'm trading, I always use a VPN. When I'm using my banking and I'm here, if I do use a VPN, I use a local VPN. I don't always use a VPN here local if I'm if I'm doing that kind of stuff. But when I'm trading, I always, 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 there's never a time I don't use a VPN. Um, you pointed out something specific, which I think is both scary because most people don't understand it. Um, and they should be aware is that when you do connect from your local IP address, to said websites, they're tracking you. If you don't think that they are, you're crazy. There are much, much, there is much, much, much documented information. There is, there is uh, documentaries on these kinds of things where all of these different services, they're all interrelated with Google. They're all interrelated with Amazon. They're all interrelated with Facebook. They're all interrelated with all of these big providers, Instagram and all sorts of things that they're tracking, there's little cookies everywhere. And so when you're at your static IP location at your house, you connect to that IP, what do you share? You share your location. Hello, most people don't even know that. That's why of course masternodes from your home were never a good idea. Your internet service provider broadcasts a, a sort of genericized list depending upon that provider of what your <laughs> geolocation is from your IP address. Um, there's all sorts of information that is shared. So always practice hygiene, good internet hygiene and prevent um, people from creating a social profile, a buyer profile, a network profile, and everything profile about you. So it's not just security or privacy in that way. It also helps you from being inundated with things to manipulate you to buy stuff. That's a whole different issue. If anybody out there hasn't watched um, The Social Dilemma, it's actually the title is The Social Dilemma. It is a free documentary on Netflix. It will disturb you immensely. Your kids, you probably will rip the phone out of their hands and take them off of their TikTok and Instagrams because you'll see what these companies are doing. And it's all done by people who used to work in some high level position at all of the companies I just mentioned. I think they I left those that. companies because they're stealing and they're manipulating you. And you know, there's a whole... There's a whole yeah. manipulation and buying that that goes on, and and it's pervasive in the social media. I almost said dilemma, the, but anyway, is that the show where they they kept? I mean, because they didn't want to talk about far right or far left, they talked about the far center or the radical center. As, uh, as I the, don't remember that, but it's, yeah. it is it is a radical, really hyper capitalist mentality yeah. where you become the product. Yeah. And so it's not just all about privacy, it's there, but they are compiling information about who you are. All you have to do is log into something where they already have your name and information and they have your IP and you log into another site, which is also connected with some company that's aggregating that stuff. Well, they know it's you, even though you didn't even put your name in there because you're on a list with this IP address. Yep. It's massive what they're doing to us. So if you can, you use a VPN. Well, what happens? Well, now you're using a VPN. That VPN has an IP on it. But whose is it? It's not yours. It's the right. service it's some, you're using. And right, so some company. no matter what you're yeah. doing, they can't tell if it's you or, hey, Rob was just using this last. So maybe it's Rob. Oh, Neeks is using it tomorrow. So they have no idea. They can't build a profile. 
And it's really good to make sure you are diligent at your hygiene for privacy. It will affect your browsing experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. How about that? That's right. And so yeah. like, it's very important. Your hygiene is like, we talked about that many times about the seat phrase. It is, um, it is the same thing. Like you have to make sure that you're conscious when you go on the internet Correct. and the VPN to make sure that you control what is the identity that you project when you move around is, um, is a great tool. So I think we, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say something because I think we're, we're, we've, we've been on this uh, for a while. I just want to remind everyone, and maybe we can create a little segment about this. When you log into the support portal, this is another subject. When you log into the support portal, it is not an email portal. It is a closed support portal. You'll get an email notification from the portal when maybe a volunteer like Gary is answering a question, right? So Gary's going to answer a question. He's an OG, long time member. He's very knowledgeable if he answers a question and he'll send a message to you. You have to log back into that portal. We shut that portal down because that, that, that stuff, um, that information was, you don't want to just send that in an email. <laughs> you know, so if you need some information, you want to log in. So there you go. Cool. Yeah, that's I, a, that's I a think good we point. covered that pretty well. Yeah, I think um, we did we did good. So we did some news, CBDC, Mongox, the Tether thing. We went through the big strategy, reminding again this whole strategy with new website, marketing communication, and then download and then exchange listing, these all connected together. And, um, and I think this is really for uh, a great next step for TV. So I think this was great topics. Um, feedback still open for avatars or topic. We don't really get much requests. So we're just going along with what we think about. And I think we'll continue with that. Great. All right. Talk to you guys later. Bye guys. All right, guys. See you later. Yeah. <laughs>